Hello. Are we uh, all ready to wrangle and corral? Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Um, Carolyn Carpen is Collection Strategies Librarian at the University of Alberta Libraries. She's previously had roles as Head of Collection Development and Assistant Director for Research Services. Central University Libraries at Southern Methodist University, Director of Public Services, Burke Library at Hamilton College, and Reference Librarian Associate Professor in the Olin Library at Rollins College. Alex Linoski has experience working with electronic resources, acquisitions, and collection development for a variety of academic libraries, from military to ARL, in a variety of roles, including management. License negotiation has been an integral part of her job she has negotiated licenses for single and multi-campus libraries, as well as for a small library consortia. So I hope we're all ready to hear them talk about wrangling and corralling license agreements. Uh, welcome. Um, so I'm Alexis Lenoski, currently at Georgia Tech. So I manage the electronic resources and licensing for all of the resources at Georgia Tech. In the past, I basically managed license agreements that trickled into me one or two at a time. And about a year ago, I started getting license agreements in droves. Every time I turned around, somebody was sending me a new license agreement. They were all coming electronically, and I'm not a print person. I'm not gonna be printing it out and putting it in a folder and taking a checklist and understanding where I am with it. I'm also pretty terrible at managing calendar things on calendars. So what I fell back on was a session I attended at the collective which talked about Trello. And they did a really excellent session, but they were more public services, so none of the technical service things were in there. But I had done one other process on Trello, so I decided to move my license agreement process into Trello to track what I'm doing. So a high-level license process, I'm guessing most people have something along these lines. So you receive the agreement from the vendor, you review it, you track the changes, you send the changes to the vendor, you get signatures, you finalize it. Finalize it can mean anything from receiving the counter signed agreement to entering it in your ERM and having your copy in SharePoint for us. So why did I choose a project management tool? There are, a couple of, there are several advantages. You can pull all of your elements of your license agreement into one place, and for me this worked out very well. Um, that includes your license requirements, you, um, your, any documents, and tracking the process steps that you have. You can also collaborate with colleagues. So if you work with somebody else who does licensing, you can include them as well. And you can also document your processes and procedures. I will say that there are a variety of options, so this is the way I do it. I hope that you take something away from it, but there's, one, there's no one way to manage a process. I've learned this from the many jobs I've had. It always seems to be different per job. There are many tools available. Just Google project and task man management tools, and you'll find 29 or 30. I settled on Trello, but I've also played around with Asana. Don't be afraid to upgrade, and we'll talk about that later. So why did I pick Trello? For one thing, it's visual. It also has checklists, and you'll hear me repeat this throughout, because checklists for me are very important. There are a variety of power-ups, which are basically plugins, and integrations that are available that help you manage and have information flow between Trello and the other products. I can actually look at a glance at a board and see what I have done with a specific license. It allows you to streamline and automate tasks, and there's just so much more, it's kind of hard to wrap Trello up in a bow and say, here you go. So there are a couple of downsides to Trello, and I thought I needed to point these out. The free version does have some limitations. I was lucky enough I had several staff members who I had signed up for Trello, so I had months of the upgraded package available to me. I did finally go ahead and upgrade on my own. Some of the power-ups aren't free, so they'll let you try them and then you have to pay for them. So you have to decide what you can and can't afford. For me, I can't afford most of them. And also it involves some time in keeping Trello up to date. It's basically another little system that you've set up for your personal use, but it does take time to keep it up to date because if you 
create a card, you don't keep it up to date, you have no information. And the only person you can blame is yourself. So I am going to, I created a board specifically for this session. So after we make it through the slides, you'll see PowerPoints, but don't despair. I actually am going to show a board live. So this is basically what the homepage looks like. And a couple of um, highlights. This is where the activity takes place if you collaborate. These are the uh, team boards in this case. And then these are my frequently used boards. So overall view of how Trello works. Um, it is composed of boards which contain one or more lists. What you see on this example is this is a list of my boards. I don't know how well it's showing up back there. This is a list. And then within that list, you have a card. So each of the individual tasks in there is on a card. So as far as I can tell, you cannot have too many lists on a board or too many cards. One of the things I do try to do is not scroll. So it really depends on the size of your monitor or if you don't mind scrolling. But if you've got so many board, so many lists you have to scroll, maybe you should create another board. So this is an overview of the, of the Trello board that I created for here, and it's showing up really badly, I think. Anyway, um, you'll notice that there are labels on each of these cards. You can create as many of these labels as you want, and you can display them. You'll also notice that there's a information that displays on the front of each card. Can y'all see that? Can, is it showing up? Um, that is one of the power-ups that I use. But here's where I track when I receive the license, who my vendor contact is, because it's not always the same person as your sales rep. This is also where I track um, when I sent my concerns to the vendor, when I send it forward for signature, and when I receive it back from the vendor. So at a glance, I can see what I have done. There are things you can do. Again, we'll show some of these on the board, but I wanted to point out to them. You can actually change the background. You can filter, which has actually become one of my favorite features. Once you fill up a board with 25 or 30 cards, filter is actually pretty useful. The power-ups, just explore them. If you're bored one day, you have a little extra time, go out, explore the power-ups, because there are a ton of them. And a lot of them actually provide really good information. We found one that provided metric information that was amazing. It was just one of the ones we couldn't afford. There's also board settings here under the more feature, which will tell you how to email to the board, as well as how to um, do some of your other board settings. Who can edit, you can add them. The email feature will actually allow you to create a task or a card by email, which can be pretty handy. So the overview of the Trello card, these are actually top and bottom of a Trello card. So you can see at the top that underneath there where all of the custom fields are. You can see the description. One of the things that I do in my description is I provide a link to where the memo is that Georgia Tech provides or the state of Georgia provides for what has to be in a license agreement. And it's like a 10 or a 12 page memo which drove the checklist that I did. And I am going to show my checklist. So I keep a link in each card to the to that memo, so it's easily accessible. You can see on the right-hand side where the power-ups are, and you can see where there are custom fields. When I first started using Trello, you could add five fields, and that was it. And they didn't move from board to board, which was disappointing. You can now have up to 50, and as long as you have custom fields on your boards, the fields move with the card, which is super, because I use the custom fields. I can't live without them. You can see the done button. So when my licenses are done, labels are removed, and it's actually moved to a completed column, and then a check mark appears. And that's actually very fun. And then you can add comments, as well as forward emails or whatever to your card. When you forward an email to the card, it does show up in the comment section. So if you have issues with a license agreement, what I have started doing is copying my Trello card on all the emails that I send the vendor, which means that it, I can track everything I've done on that license agreement on that Trello card. 
So a couple of tips and tricks that I have is to copy cards. And one of the big things that I do is I create a template card to start out with. And then once, every time I get a new license, I just copy the card, put the name of the vendor on the card, and there's my card. Use the labels. I am almost embarrassed by how many labels I have on one of my boards because I have to click twice to show all of them. So, but you can actually see what you've done and you can filter by those labels. So if you ever need to run reports or export from your board, your labels will show you where you stand. I've mentioned earlier to explore the power-ups. My two favorites are custom fields and a power-up called Butler, which is actually what I use to create the buttons. And you can actually automate your cards with a Butler as well. And that includes like every time I create a new card, add these labels, make it due in five days, do any number of things. So there's a lot of automation that you can do. And I've mentioned that you can email to the boards and to the cards. Early on, I didn't do that. I don't think I could live without it now. And you can also attach documents. I actually have one board that's not licensing that I attach a lot of documents to to move them forward to the next person to do what they need to do with. So by the time they get it, they have all the information they need and it's basically data entry. So these are a couple of the features. These on the left-hand side are some of the labels that I have created. So for licensing, I have like a done and approved, signed, in process, uh, waiting on signature, sent for signature. I actually have a waiting on vendor, which says I sent my information to the vendor, so now I'm waiting on them. You can also go back and change your process. I have a column on a board that says waiting for vendor, and I think it's gonna be changed to waiting for countersigned agreement because by the time it makes it to that column, it will be done. And that is one of the things with Trello, there's no complete, as you would see in some management tools. You move it to a column that will say done or complete. And when you actually start out, uh, Trello recommends that you have a to-do, doing, and done. And it doesn't exactly work that way for licensing because you have some intermediate steps. And then the one on the right-hand side is actually a screenshot of the Butler power-up that I used to create the Done button. So you can actually create activity based on the labels that you use to remove, to add, and so forth. And if you've got people who are actually going to complete work for you, having the Done button is a good way to make sure that your board is managed the way you want it managed. Plus, it saves you time. So before I go to the board, um, I thought there are a couple of things to get started. I would start slow. Licensing was actually the second process that I put in a Trello board. Um, start with one process, understand what you want to do and what you need out of that process and what your needs are with that process. Then create your board, your list, and your cards. Don't be afraid to experiment because that's the only way you learn how to do something. And be patient because I attended my first webinar that used that talked about Trello a year before I actually attended the session at the collective on Trello and then it was probably six or eight months later before I actually mastered Trello or started using it. So to that vein, hopefully I can manage this mouse. So this is the landing ooh. It didn't switch. Showing it. We're trying to show the web. I'm trying to show this, yes. Yeah, so let's close the PowerPoint. Are you going to, going to go back to it? No. Okay. Let's close it. Right. And we will close this. And we'll move this over here. Do you want us to get at the same time here? Sorry. And bring this up. Oh, where's our mouse? Right here. Okay. There. 
All right, there we go. So this is the landing page for Trello, um, and it's actually a redesigned page that they use. It's, I'm a team of one, so I don't use this page very often because I know the updates that I've pretty much done. But you'll see on the left-hand side any team boards that you may have, and on the right-hand side are starred boards, and I starred the boards that I use frequently. So if you click on boards, though, you get a list of all of your boards. And this is a sample. Um, is that? Yes, okay. My apologies. So what you see here are the main columns that I've used for um, licensing. And um, one of the things that I'm sure many of you have as well are consortial agreements. So there's actually a separate column that I have for the licenses that are negotiated by consortium because I don't actually have to deal with a vendor on those, but I have to send something signed back to the consortium that says, yes, we agree to these terms and we're going to do it. Um, you don't just get bars. If you click on it, you actually see where you are within the process with it. So you'll notice this top card here um, is my template card, and it's the same right here. And these are license agreements, and I apologize for, can I make this bigger? Yeah. So you see the cards in each column, and um, again, you can see what's on here. If you look at these, when you click on it, you actually see the um, card itself, and you'll notice that you scroll. So here you see all of the um, can y'all see the fields? It's looking white from here. Can y'all see? Not really. Yeah. Okay, so what you have here are the custom fields with all the information, your description. Here we actually attached the document, and then the checklist are right here. So this is the checklist right here for the process that I have, which is what I have to go through to show the steps that I go through to get the license through my system for signature. The review, send the license for review, et cetera. Then down here is the checklist that I use for what can't be in the license agreement. And this is based on the memo that is provided to me by Georgia. So that's the back of the card. And then any comments, and you can see here, I've included an email with my feedback to the vendor on what we couldn't have in there. So it's an easier way of keeping track of the issues that you have with a license agreement and knowing that you actually sent them to the vendor. When it, um, sorry. Technical okay. So here you can also see any members that you might add. This is where you would um, see all your labels and you can add and modify labels there as well. You can create a new checklist or you can actually copy items from existing checklist within the cards. So if you have different checklists for certain things, you can actually copy them if you need to. The one interesting thing about Trello as well is that there's a power up that you can do or a connection so you can actually have Trello calendar items feed into your office calendar as well. So due dates can show up in that calendar and um, the custom fields are here, and I use these a lot. 
and you just add a new field and manage it from there. And then these are the actions. If you watch a board or a card, you will receive an email anytime activity takes place on that. So if you're sharing a board with somebody else, then you have that, you can see what's been done. The share and more is where you get the link to the card. And a lot of times for new resources, I will provide a link in that card for that resource to both a license agreement and any invoicing information that I have so that they're all tied together. You can also um, email the card, and this is the link that you use. So every card has a link that can be emailed to it. And then, ooh. Over here, on the email to board settings is the email address that you would get if you wanted to email to the board. The one piece of advice that I've learned to do is that I create an email column so that I know what's new to the board and then I can put it wherever I want to put it. The other thing when you email, the body of the email becomes your description and there's really no way to kind of change that unless you cut it and put it elsewhere. So generally I will create a card and then email to the card so that it's in the comments and not necessarily in the, bot in the body of the email. But um, for another activity that I'm doing, I have things coming at me and I'm now just emailing them to an email column in the Trello board to say this is what I need to do. And so I apologize for the technical difficulties with the board, but that is at a high level. So how I've been managing license agreements here using this. So what they do is they, you know, on a high level, they just come in, they're reviewed. Once they're all done and ready to go, they go to a column to enter into our ERM. And then when they're done, they get moved to the complete column. So I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn, who's going to talk about how they then enter them into the ERM. So good afternoon, everyone. So now that we've talked about wrangling the license, I will be talking about corralling, or in our case, quarreling the license agreement. So I'm working at the University of Alberta Libraries, and some of you may not be familiar with it since it's in faraway Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It's about halfway between Calgary and the oil sands. We have a number of libraries on campus. There are six on the main campus, and then two interdisciplinary libraries on satellite campuses. The campus libraries are humanities and social sciences, science and technology, health sciences, education, business and law, and then the two off-campus cross-disciplinary libraries are the Bibliothèque Saint-Jean, which is on our French campus, and Augustana, which is on another campus in another town about maybe an hour to two hours away. We have a very large library system. At the end of 2016-2017 fiscal year, we had 8.7 million print volumes and 1.3 million ebooks. Of course, that number of ebooks has gone up this year because we've bought a number of big packages and we also do one time purchases on the ebook central platform. 
We're very fortunate to have a very large budget. We have a $26 million Canadian collections budget, so it's not as large as it sounds with the difference in the dollar and many of our products coming from the US. So it breaks down roughly 20 million for subscriptions, 4 million for monographs, and 2 million for cataloging, digitization, shipping, etc. Anything associated with, um, with the collections. So in April of 2016, we formed a new collection strategies unit. And what that did was centralize collections and acquisitions units into one location. I had originally been hired in to be the collections manager for humanities and social sciences and law. And our, my position and my colleague in SciTech, our positions were changed and we were moved over into this new centralized unit. And then two more librarians were hired in as well as a coordinator. So we now have five librarians and we have two different support teams that include four people each. We have an electronic acquisitions team with one supervisor and three staff and a monograph orders team with one supervisor and, and three staff. And in my role, which I will show you here, here is a rough version of our org chart. So you can see the collections coordinator reports to the associate university librarian. Then we have the four collections librarians who report to the coordinator. And I am the one over here on the left. Functional responsibilities include licensing, electronic resource management, and then you see my subject areas. And I've got a partner on the licensing and electronic resources side on the um, STEM and health sciences side of things. And then we each have someone else who works with us in our subject areas who have different subject responsibilities, or sorry, functional responsibilities. I have a colleague who's responsible for the monograph, ebook packages, PDA programs, all of, all of the book purchasing essentially. And then we have another colleague who is responsible for the management of the print and physical collections. Um, and then you can see we have our two teams. We've got our supervisors. Um, I work most closely with the electronic acquisitions team because of my role, but I sometimes do also work with the mono team. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what a license is before I get into our database. So licenses are contracts. The general functions of a contract are to allocate risk from one party to another, set forth how the parties will behave during routine interactions, set forth the rights and obligations of each party, and describe the party's remedies if things go wrong. And this is from a recent publication by Halicek and Reagan. And they also argue that licenses matter because they are binding legal documents. So if we don't do what we say <laughs> that we've agreed to do, we could have some problems. We could possibly lose permanent access to a particular research tool if we're not following the license terms, maybe permanently and we could also harm the reputation of the university and the library. So we do need to be careful with our licenses. They are legal contracts. Okay, so then why would we need a licensing database? Well, we want obviously to keep track of our work. Halicek and Reagan recommend it for process improvement and they recommend that you go digital completely and get rid of paper. We've done half of that. We've gone digital, but we have not gotten rid of paper. We have implemented the Coral Contract Management System. 
So we've got that in place. And then they also recommend implementing an electronic signature software. We have not implemented that, which is why we still have our contracts in paper. Um, all of our licenses have to be signed in paper by the chief librarian before they can be scanned and filed away into our licensing database and then we also file the paper in the file cabinet. Another reason why we need a licensing database is because it allows us to find the license and the licensing terms very quickly. Um, it allows, for example, for the access services staff to learn about the interlibrary loan permissions before they loan something out to another school. And it also allows our copyright office staff and the library staff to help faculty and students with various kinds of usage rights. So all of, all of the copyright staff have access to the database. Um, all of the collections librarians have access to the database. Um, and so they can just go in and actually read licenses if they should, should need to. So when we formed the new CSU, we actually inherited two different licensing databases from the former electronic resources librarian who retired at the time. We inherited the CORAL database, and CORAL is a larger electronic resource management system, but we are only using the licensing database and the organization database that goes along with that, that helps support that. We are also using something called Our Usage Rights, or OUR, and I don't know how many people might be familiar with that. It's been implemented in many of the Canadian schools, and it is licensed from the Scholars Portal, which is part of the Ontario Camp Council of University Libraries. In 2017, I was asked to do a project looking at our licensing usage rights and trying to figure out how to scale back to one licensing database. They actually didn't have all of the same content in each of the databases, so we thought it would also make sense to have all the information coming from one place. And we, we were able to customize our usage rights by building our own um, using Coral. So this is an example, and I hope you can see that, of a record from our discovery system. And I know it's gonna be tough to see. I have a tiny little arrow down there in the corner. Let's see if I can point at that here. Um, that is pointing at a tiny little set of letters that says ILL. <laughs> um, and then you can see over on the far side here, we've got the usage rights uh, that display for the users. And right now, this is coming out of our usage rights as this shows. The ILL information is the only thing that's feeding from Coral right now. And I'll explain a bit more about that. So when you click on the little ILL function, you can see we come to a conditions of use page for a journal. And we have several options. We have classroom print copies, course management systems, course packs. Right now, this has not been fully activated for use. This is part of our ongoing project. What we can do is click on the staff use interlibrary loan option there. And then it pulls up the interlibrary loan permissions for us for a particular journal. And so you can see we have this particular journal in a number of different packages from different vendors. And you can see it displays permitted and sometimes it might say to a library of a non-commercial institution only. In one case we have it says print only. So this is what the ILL staff uses to determine if they can loan from the different packages. So now I wanted to show you what our front end of our database looks like. This is version 
1.0.4, I believe. So we're only on the first version of Coral. You can see we've got a number of licenses there. We have almost a thousand licenses in total, you can see up at the top. And then on the left hand side of the screen, you can see that the database is searchable by name, publisher or provider, consortium, status, document type, expression, and a, there's the option to put in a qualifier. And this search function is important because it couldn't search the one thing I wanted it to search, so I'll show you more about that. So this is what a record looks like at the top level. So you can see we've got the license name all the way at the top of the page and then again with an agreement attached to it. And we've got the parent and children documents there. And the database prompts you to plug in a name, a database or a document type, an effective date. Um, we don't put the signatures in here. We don't, we don't use that particular field but we can upload, edit, um, and remove documents from this particular page. So the point of my project was to focus specifically on the usage rights, and so this shows you the usage rights that we will eventually be displaying when we transition fully over to Coral. We plan to display classroom print copies, course management systems, course packs, and interlibrary loan, which is currently coming from Coral. So you can see we have entered in some of the licensing terminology that refers to those different usage rights, but that is actually not what we'll display. Uh, for the first three, what we'll display is yes or no, and then for interlibrary loan, it's permitted or prohibited. So it just gives you the very basic. And then if there was a qualifier uh, for the interlibrary loan, such as you could only loan it within your country, as we saw. So when I started this project, I did not know how we would connect to the Coral database to get the usage rights out there. So. I learned about our Ex Libris tool, SFX, and we, the collections unit has access to this database, this knowledge base, but only as a tool where we search and get information from. We do not make any changes in the knowledge base. The serials team is responsible for that. Um, so what I learned is that you click on on the left hand column, oops, we have a tiny little V here. And if you click on that, then it pulls up a record and the record has the public name. And the public name is actually the code that you turn around and plug into Coral that then allows the information to display from a from SFX and Coral. So I was doing coding and I didn't even know it for a while. <laughs> and then this is where we plug this in. It's in the, something called the terms tool. And I generally copy and paste the SFX public name right over so that I don't make any typos or errors. Um, they're, they're really tricky, like for certain vendors, they start with the name of the vendor, but then they also have names that don't start with the vendor name, and it's, it can be a bit confusing. So you can see there, we've got one from a company that doesn't start with the vendor name, and then the rest do. So I find it's best to just cut and paste over. And you can edit and remove documents here as well. Um, if you need to make any changes if you've closed out a license or duplicated, you can make changes to the terms tool here. And that will affect the display of the usage rates. 
So, we ran into some challenges because, as I said, we had inherited this database and we discovered there were some inconsistencies in the license names. Sometimes the license name was by publisher, sometimes it was by product. Often the consortium is listed as part of the name as well. I think that's been helpful. Um, so we've agreed that as much as possible we want to be using the publisher, um, but we haven't made a plan to go back and streamline that in the rest of the database at this time. We also discovered we were missing some licenses and missing some information. For example, one of the things that we were missing on a lot of the older licenses were the effective dates for them. And so it was really difficult to tell if they should have been archived already um, or not. So again, that's another project that we probably need to go back and, and uh, tidy up. The big challenge that I ran into was that the terms tool was not searchable. I was a little over thorough or overzealous <laughs> in my addition of SFX public names and I discovered I had duplicated a whole lot. I got emails from the access services staff and sometimes, quite embarrassingly, the terms were different for the same, <laughs> same names. So it required that I go in and try to identify and at a certain point in time I knew the database well enough because I was spending a lot of time in there. I was able to find a large number of them and figure out why did I duplicate this, where does that license actually, where does that package belong and determine the license and then eliminate it from the one that it didn't need it. Uh, but going forward, there are actually two of us that are responsible for licensing, as I mentioned, plus other people also go in and search. And so we needed to find a way to find those duplicates so that we could analyze them and fix that. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how we did that. And then we needed to come up with a maintenance plan going forward for all of the licenses post project uh, so that we could maintain our database. So as I said, we've got some date and name problems. Those are projects that we've started talking about possibly doing some work on and maybe having our electronic acquisitions team help us with that. Uh, we still are working on scanning some of the paper licenses and downloading licenses from our consortia because that was also not done consistently. And then we came up with our maintenance plan. And we needed a targets duplicates report. And we also needed to see the changes to our knowledge base from week to week. So we decided we would maintain on a weekly plan and our IT librarian and his staff helped us out with these two reports. So this is what our SFX targets duplicate reports looks like. This was, you can see we've got IOP Institute of Physics. That actually had a name challenge because some of them were IOP and some of them were Institute of Physics, which is how we managed to do that duplication. So you can see there we've already fixed the name part of that, but we haven't had a chance to go in and um, determine which license those targets actually belong to. But this is really helpful because it shows you the license ID, it gives you the license name, the document name, and then the SFX provider or the SFX name. Um, so that allows us to tell exactly where those duplicates are showing up. So that was really helpful. Then we have an SFX difference report and you have to mark off two of the tick boxes and then it will show you the differences between those two weeks. So it keeps us up to date with what our serials team has done in terms of making changes, additions. So here's a quick picture of what it looks like. We've got removed, active, updated, and new in yellow. 
So the benefits of this project include that eventually we will only have one licensing database to maintain. Um, right now we're at the testing phase. So there's some work happening between the IT team and the serials team. Um, I don't know all the details on that, but they're prepping for that. So ultimately, the biggest benefit will be that all of the usage rights will be stored and displayed from one database. Our immediate benefit was the interlibrary loan information is now fully provided, and that has led to fewer requests to the CSU email account for interlibrary loan permissions. And then it allowed us to customize our usage rights. So in this process, I've had a chance to give some feedback to the Coral Group for possible development, um, but I wanted to share some of those ideas with you as well. The biggest thing would have been if the terms tool had been searchable. I could have been able to search for those duplicates myself quickly and fix them. And in, you know, in the case of a busy IT department, I had to wait for a solution for that. So that would have been helpful. It would also have been helpful if it was easier to create licensing reports. Because again, I had to wait on our IT <coughs> department for any kind of reports. Um, fortunately, they created automated reports that will continue for us. So in the end, we came up with our solution for that. And the last suggestion I had was to make it possible to add more than one document to a parent document. Uh, because sometimes we've had to go in and scan, rescan a license because the title list was not attached or the terms, there were terms on a website as well that applied and it was not attached. Um, so that's a bit of a drag to have to go back in. That feature might be available in the newer versions of it since we're running version one. Um, that was something I ran into. So, um, so that is everything I wanted to show you and then I've just got my reference note here for this new book by Halicek and Reagan called Licensing Electronic Resources in Academic Libraries, a Practical Handbook, and that was just published this year by Chandos Publishing. And if you want to know a little bit more about licensing, if it's new to you, this is a great book because it gives you some examples of model licenses, it walks you through the vendor negotiation, um, area, and so it's got lots of useful tools to help you out. So we are at the questions point. If anyone has questions for me or for Alexis, we are here and we will do our best to answer them. Any questions? No. Hmm? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> sure. So, do you know if the terms tool functioned with other users on the phone, or did you just test I don't. I. Can you repeat the question? Okay, sure. The question is does Coral work also with? other link resolvers besides SFX. I don't know that. I think I heard someone say that. I see Heather saying yes. Heather? <laughs> Sorry, we're calling on our coral folks here to help us out. <laughs> Don? Okay. Um, yeah, so the, we have actually EBSCO full text binder and we have been able to manifest it in that. We haven't done it quite to the extent Alexis has. I'm sorry, that Carolyn has really, really impressively. Um, but yeah, you can definitely manifest it. And it's actually, we, uh, CRC Dynix recently contributed development to a full-fledged EBSCO knowledge base integration for importing resources as well into the resources tool. So I would say it's actually probably more configured for at least that one. Um, I'm not sure about anybody using uh, 360 or other types of link resolvers. I just know those two, the code base allowed for the dexterity between the two mm -hmm. linked resolvers. And I was also gonna say, I do think that 
most of your concerns are addressed in the most recent 3.0 release, which is okay. in beta and will be coming out in another week or two. Um, so I know I search my terms tool. I even put my invoices under the same parent. I put like 50 documents under the same parent. And then um, I forgot what the second piece that was. But yeah, I think most of those are largely settled, I hope. Great. <laughs> but That's please great keep news. letting us know if they're not. <laughs> so we need to upgrade soon, that is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, give it a shot. Let us know how it goes, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we might need some help. <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot. You know, we, like I said, we updated our demo site from the ver that version to the most recent version with uh, okay. no hitches that we can see. So okay. ideally, you will have the same experience. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Question. Yes, we do. And how we do it is we just put the date ranges right on it because we're not using the resources module at all. Um, one of the things that's a little bit different about how we do things at the University of Alberta is that we do basically all, our, all of our communications is done through a shared email account and that is essentially the record of our work. And then instead of using the ILS acquisition system, we are using PeopleSoft as our purchasing tracking tool. Um, and basically the PeopleSoft setup was already there when the two departments were merged. So you can imagine if we had tried to transition systems at that point, it would have been even more complicated. So it was decided that would stay the same and we would focus on things like um, improving the Coral database, for the licenses. Uh, we also spent about a year working on a A to Z project for our databases. We transitioned all of that over to LibGuides. Um, so we had a number of other projects that were waiting for us. And the PeopleSoft system works well for us so, um, so that we didn't change. But I've come to understand that that's very different than how lots of other places do it. Hmm? We're not tracking anything except via our email, really. So um, we've got the support team that actually does more of that tracking for us. Um, they typically receive the invoices, make sure that those get paid. Um, and we're really more responsible on the content side of things, making decisions about subscriptions and purchases, trials, all of that kind of thing. Um, but often we do have to sign off you know, on those purchases and the renewals. If they go above a certain um, price point, then we have to review them before they can be renewed. Any other questions? Thank you so much.